Hello, welcome Sharna. It's a privilege to have you here with me this morning for this Tango Wisdom Virtual Summit. I am here in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. And Sharna, tell me where you are, please. I am in Long Beach, California. I'm very happy to talk to you this morning. Great, thank you. And Sharna, where did you grow up culturally? Because I will eventually mark it on the map and I wanna make sure that we all understand where we've come from and kind of a little bit of our story. I grew up in a very small town in Vermont, the Northeast of the United States. Um, it was a very rural environment, so I grew up playing in the woods and in the grass and among all the wildflowers. And that's, that's still kind of what I consider home, I think, that particular landscape, just the sense of being outside. Beautiful. And have you lived anywhere else in the world that has culturally influenced uh, how you view and experience the world? Um, I, I haven't lived outside the country for any length of time, although I've been able to travel quite a bit. So I think the longest I've been away was um, six to eight weeks at a time. Um, I've done a fair amount of traveling in Europe and uh, of course have spent lots of time in Buenos Aires studying tango. So those would be the, the two places outside the country that I've spent the most time. Great. So Sharna, in, in your writing and in your life of what you do, and correct me if I'm wrong at all, since of course this is our first time meeting, is you are uh, you teach tango, uh, you dance uh, in both roles as well, and are life coach. And I think it's an interesting combination. And in our dialogue, you had referenced how to bring the microcosm of tango out into the world to be better social beings. And for the premise of this summit is community. So I would love to hear some of your thoughts on that subject, please. Sure. Um, I think this is something I've, I've thought about for many years, you know, maybe <laughs> the very beginning of my tango adventure um, back in the late 90s. But I've, I've come to understand, at least for myself, that Tango offers this really unique opportunity, perhaps because of the complexity of its improvisational structure, to go very deep into the question of what relationship is, or maybe even more powerfully, what relationship can be. And so we can obviously reinterpret um, or reproduce what others have done, you know, in the past. But I think in exploring, you know, how we move together. We have a lot of choice because the dance is happening in the moment and in our physical body. We have a lot of choice about just creating, you know, from, from our imagination what we want that relationship to be. And, and so as we do that, um, that has, for me, like instant ramifications into the rest of our lives. Like right? we're always relating to each other, whether we're in businesses, whether we're in um, personal relationships, um, spiritual relationships with our sense of divinity, institutional relationships. So even when we're alone, I think we understand who we are by how we're conceptualizing and enacting these ongoing evolving relationships. Um, and so the tango for me is just this incredible place to learn about that, to learn what's possible in those relationships. Right, so the good, the bad, the ugly, but also the, the playful, the glorious, right, the euphoric, um, all the things that we can experience. And so when we get a sense of that range, then we can be more intentional um, about who we want to be as we show up with other people in all of these other spheres, um, right, what we're really capable of. Um, and so that sort of led me, I think, um, eventually into this position of, of life coaching where I feel like I get to improvise with people with those questions, you know, in a wider 
realm right off the dance floor but it's essentially the same for me i think whether i'm dancing or whether i'm you know working with someone on like a career question um what are those ways we can discover and practice more empowering generous respectful ways of living together in the world right through how we create our relationships and so um being that you dance in both realms, you know, I would love to hear kind of how you bring the perspective of being a leader and the perspective as being a follower into this, whether it's teaching tango to people and how to interact socially in, uh, in the tango community and how that then is applicable to the world outside of the dance floor? Um, okay, big question. <laughs> um, but it's a great one. You know, it's, I think about that a lot. I think practicing both roles has, um, again, just opened up what different ways I can be with people, right? And um, I, I see these as, you know, they're in the tango and in social dance, they tend to be very gendered, but I, I see them more from like an esoteric sense of like, what are my masculine qualities, right? What are my yang qualities? And what are my feminine or yin qualities? Um, and so that has helped me, I think, take it out of the gender realm and say, well, we all have masculine and feminine capacities, right, in ourselves, because that's just how life unfolds, right? Sometimes we're quiet and sometimes we're expressive. Um, sometimes we work and sometimes we rest. So I've, I've always seen it, the, the dance that way. Um, and in terms of, um, let's see, you asked about teaching tango and then also outside. I think because, because I've seen the roles as just sort of fundamentally different parts of human rather than you know, things that women do and things that men do, that's always made me want to teach both roles, or at least to beginners, um, because I'm seeing tango as a way to explore our humanity and our, and our connection with each other. And so um, part of that for me is embracing your whole self, right? Your masculine self and your feminine self or your, you know, receiving self and your expressing self. You know, we could use different words for that. So. That made it important for me to always put that in the classroom as available to everyone, regardless of their gender identity. Um, and then as one continues right in the social realm, you can choose, you can choose how you want to embody those things. Um, I think outside, you know, I see, I see this everywhere, but I'm, I'm going to try to think of a good example. Um, in teaching, um, I've been teaching undergraduates for the past five years, right, in addition to adults through community. Um, so I work in a couple different colleges and they respond differently to other adults. So I've found like, oh, I have to be like a different kind of leader, right, a different kind of follower with, with them um, in just in how I relate to them um, versus when I'm working like, with adults in the community. So I, I, I feel like I'm kind of drawing on slightly different interpretations, right, of each role. Um, and maybe that flexibility comes from my understanding that the roles are not fixed, right, that they're reinvented every time we do them. Um, and then uh, I think actually about lead and follow a lot with my own creative practice. Like, um, I'm also a choreographer and I have for the past two years been working in, um, in visual art, I've been, I've been painting, and so to kind of get myself into a rhythm, I think with my own work, I sometimes think, okay, do I need to lead myself more? Like, do I need to structure my time? Do I need to make a schedule? You know, do I need to just kind of direct myself more? It's more like a leader sort of energy. Or do I need to like be quiet and rest and kind of just um, sense what's going on? Or do I need to just immerse myself in the work without thinking analytically? about it and that would be for me like more of a following type of approach 
Um, so that's maybe another example where I kind of shift back and forth, um, you know, as I'm trying to kind of manage my own progress. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but feel free to probe more if it doesn't. <laughs> It's a, it's a good start. Um, okay. One of the questions kind of that pops up for me in you're describing this, it, it goes back to, to tango. And, you know, of course, we're speaking to two elements that do not exist in their own independence. Mm -hmm. And as you travel around and you teach m women how to lead and of course, there's the element of following there as well. And, you know, quite possibly you're teaching men to follow. I don't know, you know, that's certainly something that happens in a class as well, if there's the desire for that. That what are some of the elements that you find are, I guess, kind of lacking that needs some more oomph in the understanding of each of the roles that you're teaching? Um, well, I, I can tell you briefly about a, a workshop I taught recently, which I called Tego Conversations, which was for men and women. And it was specifically to get a little clear about what you're asking, I think. What, what do we mean when we say lead? What do we mean when we say follow, especially if we're not following um, conventional gender roles? Um, and so I uh, just chose three things to define each role in that workshop, right? You could, there's a lot more, obviously, um, you could add. But I just uh, chose, for the, the masculine leader energy, I chose one, establish a sense of safety. Two, take ownership of the space, right? Which is like navigation. And number three was compose the material. So the voice of the director or the choreographer. So those were the three things I worked with um, for, for the masculine role, leader role. Um, establish a sense of safety, take ownership of the space and compose the material. Uh, for the feminine or follower energy, we worked with one, establish a sense of support, two, open to receive sensation or information, and three, make your space, um, excuse me, make your shape expressive. So not what you're doing, but how you're doing it. Um, and that workshop, I'll just tell you briefly, because it was a really unusual structure. I worked with the men alone first, and we developed these follower feminine qualities for the men, because they had less experience following. And then I worked with the women separately, and we developed masculine or leader leadership qualities, as I've defined them here, through a series of physical exercises um, for the women. And then on the second day, we had a, a period where the women were leading the men. And so, um, and they were helping each other. So there was a whole guided uh, process where they would give each other feedback on developing these lesser um, skills, right? To balance out their, their tango. And then the last section was everyone in their conventional gender role, it's sort of like a coming back to familiar zone. Um, so going through those three phases and dealing, addressing these, um, these themes is kind of my way of elevating the dialogue of um, how we define those roles. So in that, Sharna, as you're working with people like that, what were some of the struggles that came up as each of the groups were not only just learning something new and learning the other effect, but what kind of insight did that give them about their traditional role? Well, um, I guess we should ask them. <laughs> um, I, I got some feedback <laughs> from that workshop um, and the first thing that people tended to say was that they felt more connected with the other people in the workshop 
regardless of whether they were male or female, um, which I thought that was pretty striking. And that lasted after the workshop, right? So these are people who had, most of them known each other socially, um, but that after the workshop, they felt um, more connected when they met at other events. Um, there was definitely a lot of appreciation for the other, right? As they're trying to learn the skills that are, that are harder for them because they're less practiced. So there was, um, a very clear sense of appreciation of what the other was doing um, for them, right? And I, I kind of phrased these as, you know, what we each contribute to the dance. So I think that made it easier to talk about in a sense of gratitude. Um, I'm, I'm trying to answer your question about, about struggle. And um, I think it wasn't, it wasn't really anything unusual in terms of what students normally struggle with, you know, when they're in their conventional role. It was, you know, the women who were learning to lead had, you know, trouble balancing like the navigation with the executing of the, you know, marking of the vocabulary and um, the, you know, the, the men who were learning to follow were struggling with their balance and their mobility in some cases, you know, when they were asked to do unusual movements um, were unusual for them. Uh, so it's, in that sense, I guess it's sort of unremarkable, like they were struggling in the same way that everyone else normally struggles, just with the, the mechanics of doing it. Um, but I think that sense of appreciation, you know, of the other role and the feeling of connection, right, that came from just switching, right, and just seeing what the other was doing. And um, there was also some time where they spoke, you know, they could speak to each other. And um, it was a little guided discussion of, about what we want, you know, when we dance. And so that was also helps, I think, to um, create a more authentic connection between people on a human level. And um, that was probably also responsible for some of the feeling of comfort and um, connection that came. So a lot having to do with the, the human factor of being in another person's shoes and getting to experience what that's like from their perspective. Mm -hmm. And that the struggles are still the same. Yeah, that's what I've always, I mean, I've been teaching both roles to all people for a long time. And that's generally consistent with my experience that it's it's not like women are especially challenged with leading you know or men are like especially challenged with following they're just skills that we can all learn you know or not learn um and uh you know maybe socially we've been led to expect certain things you know from certain gender but um but yeah absolutely there's there's nothing like seeing something from someone else's shoes you know it's the the cliche but it's true you know that that's the number one thing that creates empathy understanding you know and patience um and those are just all things i really want to cultivate whether i'm teaching dance or whether i'm you know working um, in a coaching capacity so shana when you're when you're when you're teaching people you see you had mentioned that you're teaching undergraduates mm -hmm. so i'm imagining they're beginning in tango mm -hmm. and so i'm really curious uh because of course at different ages in which we enter tango or where we're teaching or even culturally we're going to have to bring in different sets of parts of ourselves and so i'm really curious of like some of the things that you offer to the younger generation to keep them interested in tango. You had referenced traditional in one of your articles and speaking about how tradition, yes, is those that came before, but then there's always this innovative and expressive and creative aspect. And so in teaching the younger generation, how do you get them involved in the tradition and uh, bring in this new life to what will keep tango alive for us all? 
Um, I think the thing that I notice most about the undergraduates is that they they just have a lot of energy. <laughs> like you have to keep them moving. You know, it sounds very mundane, you know, but um, that that's uh, that's I think once I figured out how to do that, I became more successful as the teacher for that age group. <laughs> um, so switching roles is useful for that because they're always doing something different, right? They're they they learn that something, then they have to learn it from the other side, and so they're it keeps them it keeps them engaged, I think, more because right? it's um, you're causing causing them to use their brains in different ways throughout the class. Um, I'm teaching particularly dance and theater students, so I think they are, you know, slightly predisposed to be interested, right, in a cultural form. Um, it, it might be different if, if they were students from like across the campus. Um, but I, I think I don't, I don't do things that differently other than like keep the pace moving, you know, because they have so much energy and they tend to be distracted. So I give them lots of variety, right, in, um, in terms of what they're doing, not only switching roles, but um, working on technique, now working on music, now working on vocabulary, you know, now working on their improvisational skills. So I, I just try to keep it varied, you know, and I, that's something I, I do anyway with adults, but I probably do it more with them because they just um, have this high, kind of higher need for variety and, um, and to keep, keep things shifting, you know, throughout the class. But the other great advantage with undergraduates is that they're gonna show up every week, you know. So <laughs> you don't have to like sell as much, you know, at the end of the class, because they're like, oh, that's okay if they're a little confused, you know, because they have to come back next week because they're getting a grade for this, you know. So I think I also take a little more liberty with them sometimes in terms of the challenge, because, um, because I know that I have them for 10 weeks or 15 weeks. So I push them a little more um, knowing they're going to get a little confused, but, but then also knowing that they're going to get through that and they're going to feel the sense of triumph and satisfaction when it does start working. You know, I think where with adults, sometimes they're doing it for leisure. So I, I back off somewhat from like that threshold, right, of, of challenge because I don't want them to get discouraged and not come back. <laughs> Um, so that's maybe, a, you know, an advantage I think you have when you teach that age group is <laughs> let them struggle a little bit. <laughs> yes, uh, the younger, when we're younger, we want more of that struggle, I think, mm -hmm. is a common theme. And so, Sharna, how do you bring them from the, you know, university community out into the social scene? How do you begin to introduce some of the traditions of tango that would allow them to go into the milonga? Um, yeah, I think that's like a whole other piece of work that um, I, I have not done a lot of that, partly because of my circumstances. One of like one of the places I work isn't where I live, so it's hard for me to make that bridge for them. Um, but I did do, um, I think the most I've done in that capacity was in the class, like towards the end of the, the semester or the trimester, um, we have like a mock, you know, mock, um, social dance where I explain to them, you know, here's how it works. There are tandas and you invite someone to dance, you know, with the cabaseo or without the cabaseo and, you know, this is about the size of the dance floor. So we shrink the space down and, you know, they have a little bit of that experience in the class of like formalizing, you know, what they've learned. And then um, I uh, took some of them to, I mean, I tried to take all of them, but again, they're really busy and distracted. Um, but I took them on a field trip to a local milonga. I said, you know, here's what we're gonna do. It's like you're graduation from tango class <laughs> you know come out and see what it looks like what it feels like at an event 
Um, and some of them came, you know, and, and they, um, they got a kick out of it. I think college students are just, it's very hard to get them to commit to anything off the campus because they're so overwhelmed, you know, with their college experience. And so I think I feel more like these classes I'm teaching to the undergraduates, they're kind of like planting seeds for later, you know, and just expanding their sense of what is available to them as dancers or as actors. Um, and in fact, a couple of my students from years ago have written and said, oh, I'm dancing tango now in this other city where I moved to. Um, so that's kind of exciting, you know, and those are, is, not everyone is gonna do that, but some of them, you know, they'll, they'll find out it's something that they really enjoy. And so they'll pursue it later. So in that respect, it's basically introduce them, give them plenty of things to keep them busy and interested and struggling. And hopefully at some point in time, that seed will be watered and they'll want to come out and learn more about tango. Yeah, I mean, I think that's all I can do really. I, at that stage of their life, I, I don't think they're the target audience for like tango community building. But at the same time, they're learning all of the other things sort of gets back to our, the beginning of our conversation. You know, they're learning how to relate to each other. They're learning reciprocity. They're learning that they're not in a hierarchical relationship. They're in a complementary relationship. They're learning to respect what the other person's doing. You know, they're learning that empathy and support are really valuable when you're learning a new thing. Um, so I think that's more my agenda than making them literally social dancers right then. You know what I mean? Because that's not really realistic, I think, the point where they are in their lives. But it is realistic for them to learn these transferable relating skills. So I, I try to really emphasize those as they're learning the form. Yeah, I, I would love for you to speak a little bit more to the, that aspect of you know, helping us not just become better dancers, but also how do, we, how do we use what we learn in tango out into the world? Like what are some applicable places that we can begin to inquire for ourselves so that our tango life and the life that we live off the dance floor day to day aren't so so opposite or aren't so separate how do we begin to blend those two worlds to enhance ourselves make ourselves better people better social beings um i i honestly think it, it could probably apply anywhere and um let me just see if i can give you a more concrete Um, well, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about work right now because I, I spoke at a design conference a few months ago and um, at events like that, there's always a lot of talk about leadership, right? And how leadership is going to revolutionize the industry, whatever the industry is. And, you know, all we need is for everyone to be a good leader, you know, and as a social dancer, I'm sitting there in the audience thinking, this is crazy. You can't have leaders without followers, right? And it just seems like such a big blind spot to me in the corporate world, you know, that there's all this talk and books and courses about leadership, but no one talks about followership. I mean, there, there are a few people writing about it now, but, um, but it's almost non-existent. And so I think um, that's one big place that as tango dancers, we can just sort of say, wait a minute, I know there's a different way to think about this, you know. Um, it's not just good leadership skills we need here at the office, right? It's also good followership skills. And how do those things relate to each other? So there's, I think, a kind of bias in business or in, you know, in the corporate work world. Um, for leadership, right? And that all the good things about working are good leadership and then all the kind of undesirable things are the followership and no one wants to be a follower. Um, but we know better than that, right? As, as leaders, as you said before, these things don't exist without each other. 
Um, and so we can start to think, um, you know, no matter what your rank is, right, in, a, in an office, um, whether you're a manager or an employee or a designer or, or an executive, um, you can start to ask, okay, I know what my leadership skills are or what I want them to be. What are the followership skills that I know are also valuable and how can I deploy those? So one example I think that's overlooked and maybe under celebrated is um, attentive listening, right? Which is something that if you're a tango dancer, you know is really important, not only for followers, but for leaders as well. But I would put that into like one of the big skills of followership, right? Is being that presence, right? That allows your leader to think, right? To speak clearly, to express ideas, right? Is that power of the attentive listening. Um, it's not a passive state, right? It's a very active state. And so where can we do more of that, right? In the office and making sure that at all levels, right? Of the hierarchy, people are learning that <clears throat> followership skill and using it with both their superiors and their subordinates. Um, so when we come together in the office, right, any two people, you're not just in a hierarchical, excuse me, you're not only in a hierarchical relationship, any two people are also potentially, right, I would argue this would be better, they're also in a complementary relationship, right, as we would think of it more in tango, um, where the human element is present, where the followership skills, including attentive listening, including um, being supportive, right? And I would define being supportive maybe in tango as like being really grounded in your body and stable in your embrace and precise in your footwork. In the office, if we think about what's being supportive, right, to the leader, um, and we think of that as a complementary skill, not as a subordinate skill, we think um, we're gonna back someone up when they express an idea, right? Um, we're going to encourage people to do their work. We're gonna ask, how can I help you out with this project you're doing? Or we're gonna just look around and say, how could I improve the environment for everybody? Um, those I think are in the category of followership skills, right? Because they're supportive, but they're not, um, they're not celebrated right now in the office, but they make a huge difference. Right? If you know someone is going to support you when you offer your new idea in a meeting, you're much more likely to offer that idea right? and not shrink back and feel alone. Um, if your work environment is calm and you have all the supplies that you need, you're more likely to be productive you know, and, and good spirited. So that would be another, I think, strong followership skill that I think everyone should be cultivating. Again, it's independent of your rank um, and that would produce like stronger um, office environments on the leadership side i mean even though leadership is so overemphasized um, it's often like too overreaching right we think the leader should do everything um, and that's not good either so in an office where you're thinking all right well i work for this person so i just do what they tell me you know that's going to force them into a micromanaging role you know so I think we need to slightly shift our expectation of, you know, leadership as well. So it's not so um, all encompassing, but it's more like we just expect the leader to create structure, maintain timelines, you know, maintain accountability. We don't expect them to micromanage us, right? And so we relieve the leaders of that job and that makes them more free to do what they really need to do, right? Which is see the long term, see the big picture, you know, make sure everyone's connected, right, in the various parts. Um, whereas on the dance floor, you would think, well, the leader is navigating, right, managing the space um, and creating a safe place for the partner to dance in, right? In the office, we want to encourage them to do something similar in terms of the longer term planning making sure everyone has what they need in order to do their work, but not getting lost in the details, you know, of how everyone does their work, because then, then you're diminishing the, the, you know, employees and designers and engineers, they need to be stepping up and taking care of the details. The leader can't really do the big picture structural stuff if they're 
trying to um, micromanage everyone too much and you know make too many small decisions. So that's I think I'm trying to describe I guess from the other side how we can balance out this idea of like leading and following in the workplace. But how's how's that coming across, Judah? <laughs> <laughs> It, it sounds great. It sounds like um, the established roles and communication of those roles can really foster this collaboration that we so long to have, you know, and feel a part of what's happening. And in Tango, we have the blessing of we have a clear role. We have a leader and a follower. And in our daily life, it's not so clear all the time. Um, so that's a great challenge, right? <laughs> it's a blessing to have in the Milonga and, uh, in within the Tango community to know the role and it doesn't have to be communicated so much, but out in the world it does. So Sharna, um, as far as like taking these skills, of course, because we're speaking of, we're going back from Tango, we're going out into the world, we're going back into Tango. I'd like to take that back towards Tango into not just the leader and follower relationship, but how does this add to the social environment, to the community at large, whether it's just your local community, um, you know, let's let's speak just to local community right now of, of how do we bring this into that arena? Um, you know, I have this sort of addressing your question. What is comes up immediately for me is that um, as I've been living here in California, you know, since 2011, um, I've realized that um, because I've been involved with graduate school and different things, right, I'm not as involved with my local Tango community as I was when I lived in Washington, D.C. and in other cities. Um, and I, I feel it personally. I feel more isolated. You know, I feel like, wow, I had, had so many... Um, not just you know friends in the social sense, but I felt like I had so many people that knew me and supported me just as a human being, right? As well as for my work, you know, um, people I could you know, network with on a professional level, but also spend time with um, on a on a social level. Um, ways I would learn about things happening in the city, you know, people I could talk with about ideas that were important to me. Um, and that whole ecosystem, I think is, I, I think is a mark of a healthy society based on what I've read. I think that sense of inclusion, right? And having, having different kinds of networks, right? Both professional and social and recreational and having that kind of on, ongoing dialogue with, with people who you feel care about you in some way and are interested in you. I think that is healthy. That makes more healthy human beings. Um, and social dance is, is a, 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 like a magic recipe for creating that kind of fabric. Um, and I felt the loss of that, right, as I've lived here in this new city and, um, you know, for a variety of reasons haven't been immersed in, in that. Um, so I think that's, that's been really interesting just for me to feel, right? And to again, appreciate in retrospect all that I had and what Tango had brought me through my involvement in it. And I don't think I'm alone in that. I think that's something we all recognize, um, that sense of inclusion. Um, and I think that, you know, that just makes us feel stronger. It makes us feel like, more content and more um, agency, you know, in our lives. Um, and so I don't know how to get that without, um, you know, a similar activity 
right? So social dance does this, I said, kind of magically, right? Because of the close physical proximity, because of the way that, um, the way that it introduces you to so many different people quickly, um, because it's a inherently creative act, right? And that creative act is you sharing yourself with other people and that creates bonds. So I, I mean, I think this could happen through something like, you know, a rock climbing club, you know, or any other sort of outdoors sports, you know, related activity, like a, a group that gets together and does something on a regular basis. But I don't know if it would be the same as a social dance community. Um, I mean, I'm pretty certain it wouldn't be the same. It might have some similar aspects, um, but I don't think it would have as large an impact, right? Just because the number, the sheer numbers of people you meet are probably less. Um, but if anything, you know, I, I, I think it's, you know, it's a strong argument for social dance, right? And tango is probably among the strongest, you know, social dances in terms of what it does to bind people together. Um, so I, I don't know what, what other things do that to that degree, um, but I, you know, I would certainly be looking for them. <laughs> you know, any other sort of activity that gathers people together that's not, uh, that's not inherently commercial. I think this is sort of the fundamental principle um, that's based on enjoyment of nature. It's based on creative expression. It's based on fellowship together. You know, I think people probably get this from their place of worship a lot. Because um, again, you're connecting with others around something that's important to you that's not commercial. Um, and that's just urgent, I think, right now, you know, in the way that we live where almost everything has been uh, commodified and commercialized. So I'm not sure if I answered your question again, but um, yeah, I think there's just something really special about social dance, you know, and what it makes, what it creates um, f for people and, and, and how that is just a, a fundamentally supportive thing, right, in living in any sort of society. And tango is a unique phenomenon in itself in the social dance world. And for any of us that, that dance tango and have fallen in love with it, there's certainly this like desire for more and more of it. Um, what would you say is the unique quality that tango brings? Like to articulate this that we feel that we're so drawn to. Is there anything that you in particularly would say tango or could articulate for us for those feelings of why we come to tango and why tango offers so much to us? Well, I, I, I first really don't want to uh, speak for anyone else because I think, um, I think it's actually important that, you know, everyone can articulate meaning for themselves, right? It's sort of part of the experience of improvisation is, is, is that you, you get to create meaning for yourself in, in the dance. And that's really important. Um, so the fact that people express this thing in different ways is really good, I think. And, you know, I hear it expressed as like connection and intimacy and wholeness and creativity and transcendence and, <laughs> You know, lots of words. And I think that's good because it's people assigning words to something on their own. That, that autonomy is important to me. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I personally believe just as a, you know, as a scholar of dance and a like, practitioner um, that there's, there's a really important component of social dance and tango in particular that activates body intelligence, right? And especially in a world that diminishes our physical intelligence, um, that is priceless. And so the way that tango engages our physical body in making meaning, in making relationship is very unusual, even in the world of social dance. And I think there is probably something there 
um, that that is giving rise to all these descriptions of connection, intimacy, wholeness, um, joy, you know, in the momentness. I think it is very much about how the body is activated and becoming sensitized, um, and then um, connecting with another body, you know, another nervous system. I think that for me parallels a lot of study I've done in spiritual practice and mindfulness practice in performance theory, you know, it's, it's all kind of this underlying, like lifting up and activating of the, um, I'll just use that term physical intelligence for lack of a better one, you know, for now that balances us, right? Because we live so much in our mind um, and that's not who we are in a holistic sense. And so getting in touch with that nervous system, the feeling sense of who we are, does feel more complete, right? Especially when we're connected with others. Um, it does give us a more complete sense of who we are and therefore what we're capable of. So it's kind of, for me, like a coming home in a way. And, and tango, because it's accessible, just so many, right? You don't have to spend like 20 years in a conservatory to like learn to lift your leg up in the air. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not that kind of dance, right? It's designed for everybody. Um, you know, not say it's easy, but, but I think you know what I mean. It's not, it's not a highly cultivated performative stage form at its essence, at least, you know, that's how I understand it, how I was trained. Um, it is fundamentally accessible to everyone. How would I do with that? <laughs> that was great. <laughs> it's hard, you know, they're asking beautiful questions and they're just, um, you know they're they're hard to put into words, but hopefully we're 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 generating some some more questions or some more interesting dialogue as we go. <laughs> Absolutely, and you know because there's there is so much feeling, and it is rather difficult to put language to what we experience. And so I appreciate you know your your candor in saying you can't speak for anybody else, but some of these words that come up because sometimes you know, we need to hear a word that says, oh, that's, that's what it is. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I love that you bring in the aspect of, you know, the, the physical part of it, of it brings us into our bodies. It, it brings us into an intimate relationship with another person in the nervous system, you know, that helps us sort of connect at a biological place and um, and remember parts of that biology that don't often get recognized unless they're out of kilter. Mm -hmm. And I know that I've used Tango as a place of therapy, you know, as a place to go to to heal. And um, as a social act, it really is um, a multifaceted arena to experience my humanness and other people's humanness and to learn. And for, for me, certainly, I feel like Tango is a great place for self-inquiry to not only be able to dance well in my physical body, but to be able to relate well. And so I kind of, uh, I really respect your work, Sharna, of bringing tango and the aspects of the roles and the qualities and the energetics of each of them on the dance floor and in life. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, dude. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat. My pleasure. And I think we'll, we'll wrap up right now and then I'll ask you our little extra bonus question. So before we do that, please tell everybody where they can find you, uh, different things that you have going on, um, things that you want the world to know about what you've got happening. Sure. Um, well, I, I post almost everything I'm doing, including um, my blog, which you've mentioned, uh, where I frequently write about leading and following on my website which is just my name, uh, sharnafabiano.com. Yeah. 
always happy to hear feedback on the writing um, or anything else that you find there. I have information about coaching as well as tango workshops and teaching. Um, so I'd be happy to hear from you anytime. Thanks so much for listening. Excellent. Thank you, Sharna.